It's only 2.4% of Americans that are at a normal weight because they eat healthfully and exercise regularly. So remember, so that when people say oh, a normal person or a normal young doctor died of COVID, it's not a normal young doctor. He's a conventional eating, smoking, or drinking, or junk food eating, or fast food eating, or he's, he's not a healthy person because those aren't foods. Those are food addict addicted people. And just because they're like other Americans doesn't make them healthy. We're not, suppo we're not designed to be living on junk food. Hello and welcome to the Switch for Good podcast. I'm Alexandra Paul and I'm here with my... <laughs> Wonderful. I know, I always say that. I realized I didn't look, look up a, a... Synonym. Yeah, synonym. I didn't bring my thesaurus today. My amazing, wonderful co-host, Dotsie Bow. Just throw them off and say like my lame co-host and see if anyone notices that you didn't say wonderful. Uh, well, you, you know what? You work so hard with Switch for Good Foundation. You've put out this amazing report um, called Dairy Does a Body Bad. But you also have this power plate for athletes, which... Also kind of sticks it in the eye of the USDA's plate, uh, right. their food plate, their pyramids, whatever they're making. Um, and uh, so tell us a little bit about this power plate that Switch for Good has put together and is, and you're giving away. It's an awesome... Yeah. Um, it's like a fridge magnet. Fr so fridge magnet. Not so, forget. Yeah. So stay tuned because Dotsie's going to tell you how you can get one yourself. Yeah, for sure. So thanks for mentoring the port, right? That just got released last Thursday, and um, it's going to be going to all of the uh, college and university athletic directors, all of the professional sports teams, um, performance directors, um, oncologists, gastroenterologists, gynecologists. It has a big release plan, but we released it just uh, last Thursday. Um, which by the time this airs, will just you know, Bill had been released for about a month, kind of to the tribe, right? To 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 all of our peeps, and we're going to be doing a Zoom rally coming up where people can ask the questions and and uh, just it's it's kind of like a drip launch because there's 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 so much in there and it's an, it's really unprecedented. I mean, never before have uh, this many physicians and dietitians reviewed this much uh, research on dairy. We cite 322 studies, but it was written in a way purposefully for just us regular folks like you and me yep. to be able to disseminate to us and, and we're able to read it and truly understand what it's talking about. <laughs> and then with this with the citations, uh, it, it is it is a very high level and and you know certainly comes across to any researcher or PhD or scientist in these fields as um, you know quite legitimate because of all of, of the studies that that we go through and reference. So um, I read it this weekend. And I it's know. Really, it's really readable. It's fascinating about why, just from the history of why we're so obsessed with dairy in this country. Sure. Uh, how government and business have colluded to get us to uh, in consume more dairy. And it's just fascinating. So I recommend that everybody go to the Switch for Good website and download the report yep. themselves. Even just reading the first five pages, I promise you, even if you've been vegan for decades, you will learn so much about why this, uh, why our country is, you know, so dairy prone. Right, right. And the, and the and all of the ill effects that it has on people, not only from a chronic disease standpoint, but, you know, specifically with athletes, because that's who they've been targeting, you right. know, in these in these most recent years. And you know, my story in, in terms of, you know, as an Olympic athlete leading into the Olympic Games for the, you know, couple of years before um, the, the games, I, I went plant based and, and I just I found it so frustrating and so confusing as to why I couldn't find uh, any information on what I might eat if I wasn't going to, you know, guzzle gallons of, you know, cow's milk. Uh, the nutritionists and dietitians really didn't have any information. They didn't know where to source it. They just were literally being fed the the information from the dairy industry via because they are the title sponsor. Um, and so in this report, too, we, 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 we unfold kind of the, the links, the missing links behind those studies, how the controls are quite off. And, and almost all of the built with chocolate milk studies are done uh, on less than 10 subjects. Um, <laughs> so this power plate, we can just go quickly, but um, this is basically the answer to the, f the frustration that I had as an athlete. The uh, U.S. Olympic Committee has an athlete's plate. 
and uh, you know, it's just a bunch of dead things on it. You know, it's it's brown and white foods uh, mostly. Is it lots you of know, lots of lots of meat. Uh, you know, just dead animals, and then and then uh, you know products from animals mostly and there's a little tiny part where there's some vegetables so our goal with with this was to help nutrition it was actually a nutritionist um in minneapolis that asked us to make this because she said i use that usoc plate for my animal food based clients but i need one because i'm getting more and more plant-based athletes and i need something to help guide them can you make one with just plant-based foods it was like wow of course and so we had a couple goals one was obviously to really um source out the macros and the micros. And the interesting part uh, that we're going to go in today with this incredible doctor that we have on, um, who really pushes a nutritarian diet. As an athlete recovering, when I went plant-based, I quickly realized that the micronutrients were so much more important. And that's the conversation I should be having with myself, not where am I going to get my carbs, proteins, and fats, because they just automatically you they just come in when you focus on the micros so we focus so just, on just for our audience who doesn't quite understand yeah. macronutrients are protein carbs and fat like you just said and exactly. micronutrients are like vitamin d vitamin a right and all and your antioxidants calcium. and phytochemicals and all of the wonderful beautiful you know density that it, it it is in plants and really are the key to unlock premium recovery and repair uh as an athlete you need the the, the macros but the, the micros are when i started when i folk started focusing on the micros is when i started really noticing like my repair just you know speeding up and i was you know kicking my teammates butts that were 10 years my junior it really is focusing on this so the the other aspect of the plate that was important to us is that it when you look at it you hopefully uh your mouth starts watering it's beautiful, very colorful, which is a really this, important to get those phytonutrients. Yeah. If you get a lot of color and variety in your diet, which we've heard from guests on this show, then uh, you know you're 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 on your way. Yes, it's really yes. key. So, so people are going to want this. So if you do, if you go to um, switchforgood.org, there's pop ups kind of almost on every page. Download your free power plate. But if you want a refrigerator magnet, which is what we're holding right here, uh, which are pretty awesome <laughs> for you to be able to, when you open the refrigerator, it reminds you what you should be looking for in there. And if it's not there, go get it. Go to your farmer's market. Um, then you know what? Just email me info at switch for good and I'll send you one. No problem. Great. Uh, and we'd love a review. <laughs> we'd love a review for the podcast too. Yes. Oh, listen to you. Wow. She just slips that in. Yes. I did. I did. Do that. And uh, <laughs> yeah. Okay. So it's a trade folks. Yes. If you want to... <laughs> If you want a fridge yeah. magnet, I'll send it to you, and then you do a quick little review for us. That's just for your karma, um, Dottie. You'll, <laughs> I know you'll you'll hand it out anyway, but um, but if you want really good karma, just give us a good review too. <laughs> All right, let's because you're the karma keeper, apparently. <laughs> That's right. Wow, I'm keeping score, you know. <laughs> um, let's introduce our guest yes. today. He is extremely well known throughout the plant community, um, plant based community. Uh, but also around America because he's been on so many shows like Dr. Oz, Good Morning America, talking about how important it is to, to eat a nutrient-dense diet. He has also written seven New York Times bestsellers, including the book Eat to Live. Eat, Eat for Life just came out in this year in 2020. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to talk about this. He's also incredibly generous with his time and knowledge so that he because he's very, very passionate about spreading the word. So you might have heard him speak at a local uh, veg fest um, or on the many podcasts he's been on, um, on all over the Internet. The, we're going to talk about his term nutritarian and how important it is uh, to adopt a nutritarian diet and what's different about it from another other whole food plant-based mm -hmm. diets and also secret he was a competitive figure skater with a couple uh, world champion um, uh, medals to his name. So you can talk about him. Tatsi is, I mean, also <laughs> lots of world champion medals to your name, too. Um, but so, Dr. Joel Furman, we'd like to talk to you about your past and your present. Thank you so much for being on the show. Great to be here. Hi, everybody. Nice. Nice to see you guys. <laughs> So let's start off with your figure skating b days because I watched a video of you and your sister um, competing in the world championships in I think it was seventy six, and you were seventy six. Yeah. Tell us how you got from a figure skater to a doctor. Oh, 
You know, when I was skating in my late teenage years, my father was sickly and overweight, and he like was started to read health books. So I was reading them with him. I started to read a lot of the natural hygiene literature from Herbert Shelton in the 19- that he wrote in the 1950s and 60s about the harmful effects of processed foods. And the, the, so I started to imp- change my diet, actually, as it was in my teenage years. And I watched my father lose weight and get healthier, too. But I started to become passionate about that literature. And when I left, when I quit com- amateur skating, because in those days you had to be an amateur or a professional because you couldn't compete in the Olympics if you took any money and things like that. So, um, so I started, so when I turned pro and started teaching skating and, com- and performing in ice shows, and I was started to move into my father's um, chain of shoe stores, I was going to take over his shoe business, and he had a chain of shoe stores in New York City. Um, I realized that my real passion was nutrition and, 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 and the idea of becoming a physician who specialized in nutrition would be the pinnacle of a career that would really interest me the most. So I met my, started dating my wife at that point, and she was actually um, um, going, going to go to medical school. So, so, I, so at that point, with that kind of extra motivation, I'm saying, why well, dabble in some courses? So I quit, I quit my father's shoe business, went back to the postgraduate pre-med course at Columbia with my wife at that time. Then we got married, we both went back to the postgraduate pre-med course at Columbia. So I retook the college courses. I had graduated from college, but I hadn't had all the pre-medical requirements because as figure skater, I wasn't um, trying to achieve medical school at that point. So once, so then I went back and took all those courses and went to medical school with this, at the age of 29 with a specific intent to become a physician specializing in nutrition. Had you become plant-based when you were a skater? Uh, what and what actually drove was it an ethical or was it a purely health reason that you um, gave up meat and dairy? No, it was p- purely health, performance, and stamina. I enjoyed killing animals. I just didn't want to eat them. Oh God! <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so back then, I mean, there wasn't any that I know of uh, real scientific data on it improving performance, and this is fascinating to me because even in you know my day, which you know to the Olympics in 2012, uh, you know I kind of felt alone in in the journey those couple years before, which is now like 10 years ago. So how did you? Yeah, how did you get the memo that this could be incredibly important for performance, repair, recovery, and output? You know, mostly because, and you know, I also found this to be the case. I advised the U.S. ski team and Eric Schlappi. Eric Schlappi was in four Olympic Games. Um, when I'm mentioning four Olympic Games, because for a downhill skier to be there for 16 years yeah. as they get older and still maintain at the top of his career, we're talking about prolongation of your athletic ability by being, becoming more youthful. When I, when I was doing it back in the 19, early 1970s, it was because I noted that the major flaw of people's careers and training is they get sick, they lose training, they burn out, and they, in other words, the point is, is that when you're at the top of your career and there's a, and the difference between being the top 10 in the world or being nowhere or being the top three is all about timing and your ability to be healthy and not get sick and keep training and not overtraining. And so if you're not, if you have to worry about catching a cold or being sick or losing training or, or being, so in other words, by eating right, and you're exposed on planes and exposed to different um, infectious agents. And so the point is never getting sick so you can track, so you can train and continue to make progress every single week without overtraining. What people have is they're out of their training, then they're overtraining, then they're undertraining, then they're sick and they're thrown back again. And so I, I felt that with us eating so healthfully, we would never get sick and we'd also have better stamina. And when you get to the top of the skating world, the, the ability to perform with a lot of stamina and still be fast at the end of your program, fast and strong as you're getting exhausted, is the whole key, you know, to being top and at the top level in the world. Especially the Russians used to be incredibly strong and have incredible speed and strength. And we're talking, especially we're talking about, um, you know, tennis, basketball, skiing, skating, you know, these type of boxing, these type of things that. Um, whereas we know that the Nash study showed that. Um, professional athletes weighing more than 250 pounds, uh, linebackers on football teams, have the shortest lifespan of any profession in North America. So eating to get Mm -hmm. maximally sized at a level of size that isn't natural for our species is not, is something that's going to radically shorten your life. So we can improve our strength, our stamina, our ability to do like perform for our body weight, jump high and move fast from side to side as a tennis player, but we're not going to maximize our size to get that big. To do so, you have to chronically overeat. 
And I, I'm, I'm sorry, but I don't think that any kind of diet, vegan or um, meat-based, is good to eat to get that, to get unnaturally large like that. Yeah, okay, so you basically, you you and Eric, you were eating really to boost your immunity. I mean, it was to, to not get sick because the, the, the whole cycle that starts when you do. So how did you know that this, did you know that this was a nutrient-dense diet? And how did you know that that was going to boost your immunity? And, that, and, and how did you n- realize and not believe that you needed animal foods to be healthy, not even just large, just, just healthy. I mean, how did you guys kick that out? Did you start just diving into reading and? Yes. Read a lot of books. And I, you know, at that point in my life, I, I read most of Herbert Shelton was working a natural hygiene movement. So he was, he, so that it was a, an organization called the American Natural Hygiene Society or the National Health Association back then that advocated mostly not eating natural plant foods in large quantities, you know, big salad, nuts, beans, you know, and, and trying to reduce processed foods and animal products. It wasn't, they had a lot of crazy things they also advocated, but it, of course the diet was clear that these undiscovered phytonutrients were absolutely essential for normal humans, which were essentially evolved from the primates and were, that were similar genetically to a primate structure. And without a good intake of green vegetables and nuts and other things like that, we couldn't maximally expect maximal immune fist system mm-hmm. or performance. And the idea, the concept was set into place back then that getting sick was unnatural that developing obesity, diabetes, high blood pressure, heart disease, strokes, cancer, and dementia were not the inevitable consequence of aging, and they were not natural for our species. I was learning back there, even as a teenager, that it's normal for an animal to live out its, its normal life expectancy without developing chronic disease, that preventing it from performing as it, performing through up to its later years. And I evolved the nutritarian diet to enable people to live to be 100 years old, which is not a blue zone. A blue zone, the average person lives to be a 90. There's some centenarians, but I want the average person to be 100. Mm. We're talking about to be, do much better than a blue zone can do. But in doing so, we enable to people to have their physical capacity and their full mental capacity throughout their later life, whereas a person in America who maybe lives to be 80 still has such a deteriorating quality of life between 70 and 80 years old that the last 10 years are living in suffering. So there's no, so we're talking about living to 100, where we're actually living to 98 or 99, having a great active physical life. And that's what I think these advancements in modern nutritional science make possible. And now we have, a, we can actually look at also some of the deficiencies or flaws in the vegan diet. And my experience over the last 30 years, which I've cared for a lot and mentored a lot of these um, a lot of the people and physicians who were actually established the natural hygiene movement in the American Vegan Society from the early 1950s and 60s, who as they became elderly, developed certain problems like dementia or Parkinson's due to fatty acid, DHA deficiencies or B12 deficiencies. So I could look back and see, okay, what were these people missing doing the blood test and actually with the ability to supplement conservatively in conjunction with a plant-based vegan diet that's very nutritional, rich, and complete, we can enable people to have the best possibility to live a disease through life and also to reverse disease if they have something wrong with them. Mm -hmm. So you've been... um You've been in, reading about nutrition for a long time. How you just mentioned that your philosophy you've lear- has changed. How has your food philosophy changed um, in terms of how we can get the optimal diet for longevity and good health and recovery? Well, okay, I'd love to answer that question, but I have no philosophy. I, philosophy means there's some kind of agenda you have that you're trying to promote and you're trying to get the science to fit that agenda or philosophy. I just go where there's the, the overwhelming amount of evidence. Uh, in other words, I want to just let evidence and science and clinical empirical evidence of working with thousands of people shape the direction, right, of the where we're going. So I have no predetermined agenda or want, desire to be plant-based or anything. I was years ago, I was even thinking a little bit of fish would be okay in the diet. And the reason why I'm, I've, I've modified that more in recent years is because of the pollution of the oceans and the dumping of so much plastic and garbage in the ocean that even the small fish like sardines 
and scallops and and the, any kind of um, muscles are now contaminated with microplastic. And you have people have microplastic in their body. And I'm, I don't even recommend brown rice at this point because brown rice is contaminated with arsenic because of the way we're using chicken manure and also we've growing rice patties on co on cotton fields in prior years where we've used also kind of chemicals on them and rice the husk of brown rice very effectively sucks arsenic out of soils and concentrates it in the kernel of the rice so i use other grains like quinoa that aren't you know that are grown in better safer soils and also not as arsenic attracting as brown rice is so um so in other words yes a lot of it um this is not um philosophical based or even ethically based. Mm -hmm. It's just based on what's giving mo people most performance and most ability to get well and reverse disease. So, and I have that acronym, G-BOMBS. And I go, you guys must have been familiar with that acronym, G-BOMBS, B-O-M-B-S, to illustrate and have people keep in the forefront of their mind the foods with the most powerful association with lower rates of cancer. It's just to have, with the foods that have the most scientific documentation that have the most protection against cancer and promoting longevity. And it is greens, beans, onions, mushrooms, berries, and seeds. And we could you know, throw a dart at any of those foods, but just to give you an example, mushrooms are, have the most powerful um, anti-angiogenic effects and most powerful anti-aromatase effects. In other words, they block excess estrogen and they block the production of fat storage hormones and of course they block, they block um, cells getting, cells replicating and getting a blood supply that could cause cancer. Very powerful anti-cancer effects. And I'm mentioning this compound called ergothionine as an example, because the cell receptors on our, every cell in our body has an ergothionine receptor that comes from mushrooms. Our body is designed to accept certain phytonutrients that are high in mushrooms. It's as if we're designed in advance with some DNA stabilizing um, me mechanisms that are based on mush getting mushrooms as a phytochemical. The same thing true with green cruciferous vegetables. The most powerful stimulator of the NRF2 transcription proteins which prevent genetic defects from being expressed, like a GSTP1 gene that causes breast cancer, a BRCA gene, that's preventing defects from being expressed, mm -hmm. and increasing cell repair and DNA repair are the ITCs in green cruciferous vegetables. We're designed to be taking in these substances, and without them, we can't expect normalcy. So I'm saying that these substances are essential to develop a normal human immune system reaction. And in this climate of a novel infection that came into the world like COVID is a nutritional problem because it would never have the ability to d damage people or hurt people that have an excellent functioning immune system exposed to G-bombs on a daily or regular basis. When we're eating the foods that the body needs is designed to, um, to, achieve, to accept and utilize for cell function, we're taking in the foods designed for the human species then our body becomes resistant to those diseases and we have multiple means of resistance from virals to invade, replicate, evade, capture, mutate to more dangerous forms, cause cytokine storm. All these things only can happen in people that are dangerously immunosuppressed because they're eating a standard diet without the nutrients and foods that humans actually need. Mm -hmm. and humans actually require. I'm saying we require green vegetables. And if you don't like green vegetables, then you better live close to a hospital because you're going to be in there pretty soon. <laughs> Can we do mm -hmm. one qu super quick rewind on the rice? Because um, if uh, listeners are having the heart palpitations that I did because I eat brown rice. How how about black rice, red rice, white rice? Is, did they have this, the, does that husk bring in uh, like the arsenic as, as much as the brown rice husk? Like are there, do we just, just need to clip it on all the rices? Yeah, well, white rice, as you know, doesn't take in as much arsenic, but that's high glycemic junk food. Sure. You no. Know, the other rices, there might be some wild rices that are grown in wild environments, for example, that are raised, that are, you know, hunt, hunted and raised by, you know, Indians in canoes that knock them down, that don't have commercially raised, that are in commercially raised rice beds. But I think most of the um, rices, including wild rice, are relatively high in arsenic okay. compared to other foods if they're commercially grown and they're commercially fertilized, and that includes organically grown rices. And I didn't do the studies on the rices. Consumer Reports did the studies right. ascertaining the arsenic levels. So you have to go back to Consumer Reports to get the data on the amount of arsenic in all these different rices they tested. 
So is it because of the chicken manure specifically or is and and that rice set tends to absorb this because wouldn't it be an argument that other vegetables would have the same issue? No, they don't. They are the vegetables don't take up arsenic as much as rice does. Okay. Even when there's arsenic in the soil, there's arsenic mm-hmm. in all soils, but rice takes it up more avidly than other vegetable other grains and vegetables or do. Vegetables. Plus okay. the fact that they grow rice in a lot of the old cotton fields which used um a lot of toxic chemicals for the boil weevil and other cotton cotton invading oh, yeah. insects which had no p- desire to be to not put chemicals down and there's still chemical residue in soils could last for 50 years yeah c- cotton we love cotton as vegans but it if it's not organic it uses a lot of uh pesticides and chemicals unfortunately yeah um, can we just stop in the um make one more park it at the g-bombs uh i i feel like most of our listeners and 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 i have a a good sense of the uh incredible nutrient density of everything on here except i'd love to hear more about onions yeah me too i mean i eat a lot of them but but it's because i like them what is so wonderful about them they're so critical and what i'm saying right here is that I'm saying that these four foods, mm-hmm. two cooked foods would be mushrooms and beans, because beans have to be well cooked, mm-hmm. and mushrooms should be cooked. And two raw foods, meaning onions and greens raw, are the foods that have the most powerful effect to give you the healthiest microbiota, the bacteria that live in the gut, and to not only improve the microbiome, but to thicken the biofilm that adheres to the villi, thus slowing the glycemic effect of a moderate glycemic food. We know that high glycemic foods like white potato and white rice and white bread or things are dangerous, are not healthy, especially for overweight people. And the high glycemic food, your glycemic index or glycemic load of your diet is a negative towards weight gain and cancer and things like that. What I'm saying right now is that when you eat a moderate glycemic food like like, um, corn or peas or oatmeal, it lowers the glycemic effect dramatically when you regularly eat greens and beans and onions and mushrooms because the thickening of the biofilm that coats the villi slows the transition of glucose into the bloodstream from a moderate glycemic food. So how do you make a tropical food like a mango low glycemic? You eat mushrooms and beans and, and greens, the other meals. That you so, so I'm explaining that. But the point here about um, you know, the point here about these foods like onions is that they contain an uh, enzyme called allianase. That's A-L-L-I-I-N-A-S-E, allianase. And that's where when you cut an onion, it makes your eyes burn with a sulfenic acid, right? Because you're forming a lot of other sulfur-generating compounds like MSN and other. And these, in the studies on onions, it shows generally about a 55 to 88% reduction of cancers of all type, depending on the cancer type, even from something like a quarter cup or a half a cup of onion a day. So onions are some of the most powerful anti-cancer foods. It's not just the bioflavonoids and quercetin and fibers and also the rich and the one of the only rich sources of these sulfur compounds come from onions. And the allianase enzyme forms these compounds when you cut or blend the onion. Mm -hmm. So if you took the onion whole or the leek or the scallion and you plopped it into your soup and cooked it first and then you took it out with the tongs and blended it into the soup base you would have not formed many of those compounds because you would have deactivated the allianase before it had a chance to form them. Rather, if you eat the onion or scallion raw in your salad and chew it really well, that's gonna give you the most powerful anti-cancer effects. Or if you take the leek and the onion or the scallion and blend it in the blender with a little bit of liquid in there, so it, the blender becomes a chemical reaction which causes gas and sulfenic acid and you're, then you're forming all those compounds because the allianase is heat sensitive. You want to get the full activity of the allianase to form the sulfenic acid and the other organosulfate compounds. And then you can take that blender full stinky mix and pour it into the soup to cook because the heat won't destroy the beneficial compounds. It just would have inhibited their formation if you cooked it before you blended it or chewed it. But then when you eat your salad every day and you put the green cruciferous in there and the water, the arugula and the baby bok choy or the cabbages, whatever you're putting in your salad, if you don't concentrate on chewing and liquefying that in your mouth and chewing up in those cells and chewing up the scallion and chewing the onion, you're not going to get the full anti-cancer benefits because most of those anti-cancer nutrients are formed in the mouth as you're crushing the cell wall and mixing the, digest- mixing the enzyme with the other substance that forms the most beneficial effect of mm-hmm. compounds we're talking about. The best way to use the cook the food and maintain the nutrients is to put it in a high-powered blender cream it into a puree and then put it into the ba- then you could dump it to cook it into the soup and that you know? that works for um also cauliflower and broccoli and and such 
Uh, all those things, yes. Uh, if you're gonna if you're gonna cook them, you're not gonna cut them small enough. So you're not gonna break open the cells of eating broccoli and cauliflower in in a, in a mixed vegetable dish. Then we usually walk it in a dish where we're only cooking it three to seven minutes, three to six minutes. We want to cook it like al dente, so it's not wiping out all those nutrients. We want to not cook it till it's mush, so it still has a little firmness to it. You know, so we're talking, that's where we walk the vegetable dish and mix it with a Thai curry sauce or something. We're not going to cook it till it's totally, we use broccoli florets and snow pea pods and water chestnuts and bamboo shoots. And we're going to put in, and make cauliflower dishes, but we're not going to like overcook things till they're too, so we're trying to kill all the enzymes. And don't forget though, but you've got, a, if you had a little bit of that enzyme from the raw food you eat in the same meal, it would help you convert some of the cooked broccoli into the, to make some of those ITCs out of it. So there's also a benefit to eating some raw with every meal you eat some cooked with because the raw benefit you get the raw enzymes benefit the cooked foods too. Mm -hmm. That happens in the digestive tract. You follow me? Yes, I do. Um, I do follow you because I've read uh, quite a bit about what you've written in terms of your philosophy, in terms of the nutritarian diet and how to get the most um, out of the foods that you eat, that right. we eat. But it's not a philosophy. Did I say philosophy again? <laughs> oh my God! Um, I apologize. It's not. It's. I know it's based in science, and I. Oh, we always want to have people on here talk about stuff that's based in science. So, uh, uh, you mentioned COVID and how you felt that people who uh, people who got COVID. Tell me if I'm misspeaking here. People who got uh, sick from COVID. It was. They could have stayed healthy if they'd eaten a, a healthy nutritarian diet. Yes, that's what I'm saying. I'm saying that we're seeing people get sick and we're seeing people die. And of course, it affects the most sickly and overweight people more readily. You know, it hurts those people the worse their health is. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying there's no such thing as a healthy, overweight person, that all overweight people are unhealthy. Fat cells spew out lipokines and cytokines, and they produce a lot of reactive oxygen species, and they raise your estrogen levels, and they, def and they suppress your immune system and keep you chronically inflamed. The battery, you can't keep the flashlight turned on all the time if you want it to work when you have an emergency. You have to keep the flashlights turned off. And on a nutritarian diet, people's white blood cells drop very low. Matter of fact, a lot of people see the 2.5 white, white blood cell count on a nutritarian diet, and they go to the doctor. The doctor says, you need a bone marrow biopsy, because they see the normal range of white blood cell counts are between 5 and 10. And I'm saying right now, to make this clear, is that that's not a normal range between 5 and 10. That's where most Americans lie. It's normal between like 2.3 and 6 is probably a better, a real normal range. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So that the whole, on a nutritarian diet, your blood tests are even outside of the normal range because they're so much better than the average Americans. And I'm also saying that almost all Americans, if there's no such thing as a healthy person on an American diet, because conventional authorities are saying 70% of Americans are overweight, which is not true. That's because they're using a 25 BMI as a demarcation line between normal weight and overweight. And all long-lived societies and long-lived individuals have BMIs below 23. And an ideal BMI is probably below 22 for a male and below 21 for a female. When you use a, a BMI of 23 as the demarcation line, then you get 89% of Americans that are overweight, not 70%. And so we have a, a whole population of sickly overweight people. And the people that are the 11% that are normal weight, the vast majority of those, like 80% of those people, are smokers, alcoholics, drug users, sick people, medical conditions, autoimmune conditions, occult cancers, digestive disorders. So most of the normal weight people are at a normal weight because they're sickly and living so unhealthfully. And they can't gain because they're smoking. And they're, they're. It's only 2.4% of Americans that are at a normal weight because they eat healthfully and exercise regularly. So remember, so that when people say oh, a normal person or a normal young doctor died of COVID, it's not a normal young doctor. He's a conventional eating, smoking, or drinking, or junk food eating, or fast food eating, or he's, he's not a healthy person because those aren't foods. Those are food addict addicted people. And just because they're like other Americans doesn't make them healthy. We're not, suppo we're not designed to be living on junk food and, and you, know, you know what I'm saying. So what I'm saying is that, yes, <clears throat> if a person was truly healthy, they would not be vulnerable to COVID. It's a nothing thing for a real healthy immune system to fight off. You hardly even feel you're sick. I have so many, you know, hundreds of people who have been exposed with it, who have been healthy people, and they didn't even know they even got it. Mm -hmm. You've actually said that you believe that we can beat 
the war on cancer completely just by dealing with our diet and that everything, you know, that we've done is your standards are way higher, Dr. Furman, than uh, the American Medical Association, et cetera. And you, a lot of doctors won't ask a lot of their patients because they don't trust that their patients will be able to follow through. So they'll ask for less. You, uh, you're asking for you, more, yeah. more, more. To, All of it. So you, you believe that we, we could win the war on ca- cancer. We could eliminate heart disease, diabetes, right? Yes, I have to define that more specifically. You know, I'm not saying every cancer would never occur because um, obviously, let's just say you ate unhealthy the first 60 years of your life and then you switch to a healthy cancer, anti-cancer diet. Mm -hmm. Your risk of cancer goes down dramatically every year. You're off cigarettes. You get off cigarettes 20 years, your risk of breast of lung cancer goes down by 90 percent. But you really had to never smoke for it to be zero. You know what I mean? And I, and I don't think doctors should be the gatekeeper of nutritional information. I don't care if doctors know nutrition because it should be reading, writing, arithmetic and nutritional science taught in grade school. Because just think about how crazy this is. Like you, we want the people who go to their cardiologist to be told by the cardiologist to cut the salt out of their diet because they have heart disease. Well, if it was good to cut the salt out of the diet, it was good to cut the salt out of the diet 40 years ago before they had heart disease. Not now after they got heart disease and they're so sick. We, we don't tell a person to quit smoking after they go to their pulmonologist and they find out they have lung cancer. Oh, you better quit smoking now, you have lung cancer. Mm-hmm. It, it has, this has, so the real power to lower cancer rates has to be if the whole population adopted it at all ages, not just if elderly people adopted it. But the point, or the other point, but since there's a huge contrib- contribution of cancer causation for what we eat in the first half of our life, that's why the nutritarian diet can't be a moderate, it can't be a moderate intervention. It has to be true nutritional excellence, and I want people to go 100% to nutritional excellence so the body has the ability to reverse DNA defects and methylation defects and DNA breakages and remove. So you really, and I see dramatic effects. And we have tons of examples of people that have recovered from early stage cancers even. And people, you know, and so, and even people who recovered from later stage cancers and done well, like for example, some people who've, um, you know, I, I have a woman, for example, Pam, in my medical practice for years ago, about 18 years ago, who had metastatic ovarian cancer that went, went to her lung and I had six fluids, a fluid in her lung. And now this is 18 years later and she's in great health thriving, you know. And uh, she was only given six months to live. There are not many cases of people even going through chemo living that long after advanced metastatic ovarian cancer. I have lots of people like that. I'm sure nutrition has a tremendous role, but I'm not saying it's going to cause 100% wipe out all cancer. I'm saying win the war on cancer probably reduces cancer rates by 90%. But more than that, if we can go back to the whole population, all ages eating healthfully, we know that there are populations, for example, around the world from our historical records and tracking that have 150th the amount of breast cancer. I look at data from the 1960s even, we have some areas of the world that have 150th the amount of breast cancer compared to the America does, right? Mm. So, and when those populations are followed and they move to America or they started adopting more more modern um, lifestyles and diet styles, their rate of cancer skyrocketed. And it, it's, this is not predominantly genetic, it's predominantly the lifestyle and the diet people are eating. But the, nevertheless, the breast cancer epidemic is not natural. We didn't see breast cancer 30,000 years ago. We have mummified remains and we have, we go back in history and we, these are new phenomena in human history for this explosion of autoimmune disease and these type of autoimmune and, and cancer related deaths. And it doesn't have to happen. Nutritional science gives us control of our health destiny. And I'm a, a strong, obviously an advocate for people making nutritarian, which just means super healthy eating, make it delicious, make it enjoyable. It makes you, gives you more pleasure in life. It makes living life more fun. And it's not, you're not giving up taste and pleasure. Cause I know what people are thinking. They're thinking, just shoot me right now, or I'd rather die than have to eat live on carrot sticks and, and lettuce the rest of my life. I'd rather die younger and eat what I, for enjoyment is what some people are thinking. And that's their, that's their addictive self. These foods take over the brain and they're completely irrational because they think that their diet tastes better than our diet does. Mm-hmm. The diet's going to kill them as tasting better because that's what addiction is. You just get, you can't think of changing that and you can't live without it and you feel so bad if you try to stop it. Mm-hmm. But with the right information, people aren't, you know, enjoying life just as much, the taste, the pleasure of food just as much, great recipes without being addicted to those foods and having to have to have them. 
Yeah, the taste buds really do change in a very short period of time. Yeah. Um, I have a kind of a, a, a personal question for him. Um, our, our content manager at Switch for Good, her, her mom is uh, overweight, has read Eat to Live, and has found it um, just she just hasn't been able to stick to the regimen, um, unfortunately, and, and kind of really has not been able to follow through. And I mean, we know that, it, it, you know, it's, it's a multi-layered approach when approaching someone who, you know, she potentially probably has an addictive nature to um, junk food, fast food, unhealthy food. Uh, how do you work with people who are just having such a hard time sticking? You know, obviously there's a psychological layer to this. Um, yeah, what would you what would you say to uh, Christine to help her? Some people need professional help, mm-hmm. and they need a lot of knowledge. You know, I wrote the book, The End of Dieting, to help mm-hmm. people get over that addictive idea of food. But um, mm-hmm. but they have to abstain from their triggers for a long enough period of time so those addictions lessen. Some people can't dabble in healthy eating. Right. If they if they go into it 95%, it doesn't work because when they go a little bit to those foods that suck them right back up into their overeating behaviors again, they need to have some sustained supervision. And we have counselors that give people supervision in my, you know, that work for me. And I also, as you guys know, I have a retreat here in San Diego where people come and stay here for a few months. I had this place developed and built because of people with food addiction who couldn't follow a diet without some supervision and professional help. Mm -hmm. But it's not only the period of time of abstinence and and professional help. It's also changing their attitude about life and having, there's some training that has to go on for some of these people. Because when you're, when the more you're an addict, it makes you more self-consumed and more angry, more negative about life. It makes you more callous to other people. Think about the drug addict or cocaine addict who can like kill and steal and do anything to get to continue their cocaine habit. The same thing as food. People, their food, they're like, they're angry about their, their food. And they're angry people. But the point is, they're looking for the approval of other people. And when they're looking for the approval of other people, look, their, their self-esteem comes from the way people, and they're always being fought and being a difficult situation thinking people aren't looking at them well or considering them well or thinking at them or thinking about them unfavorably there's a lot of psychological baggage that goes along with food addiction that we have to undo mm-hmm. with counseling and when people become mindful they become more creative they become more grateful for the food they become more they they're able to emote more and have more care and love for other people they're able to appreciate the beauty of the world around them more they become less competitive less looking for other people's approval to get their egos glorified and more satisfied with who they are as a person and their ability to like and care for others and they become more kind to other people and and actually feel good about themselves, their ability to have goodwill for others and not try to compete with them and best best them out. So I think that there's some um, professional help that people can have to quit smoking or to eat healthfully that people just need sometimes because their trajectory of what they've developed in their life is just too put placed them at too high of a burden, and it's kept them in a prison, so to speak, and the prison is keeping them from really being the happy, healthy, and emotionally happy person they have the right to be and they could have been. Mm-hmm. You know, I think th- what you're talking about in terms of really getting help with diet is is where it is now, is where therapy was 30 years ago or 20 years ago. People feel like they should do it on their own and they shouldn't ask for help, and that if they do ask for help, it should just be from a book maybe, but not from a intense like going away to your retreat, for example, where people stay weeks or months seems too indulgent, even though health is the most important thing that we can give to ourselves and to others, really mm-hmm. our own good health, because we're better people, like you said. Yeah. Right. You know, and I, I do spend a lot of time writing and speaking about this issue. So because I know from my you know career the last three decades, a lot of people know, learn about healthy eating and want to do it. And they still fall back, back and forth, lose some weight, gain back again. They don't stick with it healthy. So I've spent the last, you know, more than the last two decades trying to figure this out and put together people what to give these people. And that's when my book, you know, my more recent books, maybe take eat to live to a new, the end of dieting and, eat, and of yeah. course, eat for life, take a little um, higher level of, um, you know, of dedication of what I'm writing about to have people better adhere to it, recognizing that some people just require, have to see this as, and treat it as an addiction and, and totally abstain from those addictive triggers for a while if they're going to succeed at this. Yeah, that, um, I think that's what exactly what I'm going to um, suggest to Christine. You know, you have to okay. supervise her. Her family, her friends has to say, 
we're going to remove all possibility of you yeah. not eating these foods and you're from your environment. Okay. You have to stay with this. If you're going to conquer your cravings and really enjoy eating this, you've got to do it 100%. And we're going to make sure you do that. For the next six weeks, I want to see we're going to have no unhealthy food around you. We're going to keep you track and make sure you're doing this per perfect. And all of a sudden, her taste will change. She'll stop. Her cravings will go down. If you had a daughter who was a cocaine or heroin addict, I would right, we keep her in our sight. We wouldn't even let her out of our sight because the tr we, we just yeah. want to make sure she can get rid of a cocaine habit. This food issue is really serious. It's killing people. Mm -hmm. And they can die, and they can die in a short period of time from their food addiction. It used to be, you know, they'll say, oh, I'll die 10 years from now, or die 50, 20 years from now. But now they could die a month from now if they get COVID, and they don't start to eat healthy and get their weight off. Right. They don't start to get down there. What we find is that even a person that's 100 pounds overweight, if they start dropping weight like three pounds a week or two pounds or a kilogram a week, even in a few weeks, we see their inflammatory markers go down. We see their risk of their diabetes gets so much better. Their high blood pressure starts to normalize. Their immune system markers start to normalize. We see tremendous improvement in immune function when a person starts to eat healthy and lose weight, even before they've lost all their excess weight. Just the fact that, so I always, I say a nutritarian is a person who's at an ideal weight eating a healthy diet or a person that's overweight, but moving towards an ideal diet, um, excuse me, moving towards an ideal weight, mm -hmm. losing at least two pounds a week. If they're overweight and not losing at least two pounds a week, they're not really on the program. Because, and, and the process of continuing to lose two pounds a week is gonna keep them in an immune protected state, whereas if they just stayed overweight, they would not be protected. Now, are they, um, are they when you say they need to be losing weight, which is an indicator that they're getting healthier and eating healthier. Is that because you you believe that we need to eat just under our calorie burn for longevity and health? And so that's where you like to keep them? Or is it because the foods that are on this nutritarian diet, um, and pl whole plant-based foods are lower calorie? It's all those things. You said either or. Um, it's, both. it's both those things. Right. So I just say, big, but, so but we can one, eat. I mean, I can. You know, you can eat. It's, it's hard to eat more than 400 calories at a time if you're eating a lot of healthy food. This, it occupies space in your stomach. You're eating peppers and cauliflower and beans and and salad and vegetable soup with the fluid and and you you know it makes you feel full. It's hard to gain so much. What I'm saying is that also when you're eating a lot of raw vegetables and some of these foods, the the calories are not all biologically accessible. Nuts and seeds, by by the way, some of those calories turn down the apostat to make you satisfied, but all the calories that the fat passes through into the toilet bowl isn't all absorbed. Beans, you ratcheted down your apostat by 200 calories from that cup of beans. But some of those calories, a lot of them are resistant starch that pass through you and go into the toilet bowl. They don't even come into the bloodstream. So you're naturally caloric, moderately calorically restricting by what we're so, so agreeing with you that when you're eating all these high nutrient plants, it makes it difficult to consume so many calories because they're so filling and because these, the nutrients also turn down the apostat in the central nervous system. The fiber, the body forms butyrate from the fiber, mm -hmm. and the butyrate signals the apostat and the hypothalamus to tell you to eat less food. The bulk, the chewing action, all the activity it takes to chew, the time it takes to absorb, the speed of absorption, all these things naturally make you more comfortable eating less calories. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, and the other thing you're saying is true too, that the other thing that you said was true, that as you eat excess calories, it speeds up your metabolic rate. So if I was gonna eat 200 calories over my metabolic rate a day, it's 100 ca it's 365, 3,500 calories a pound. So that's, if I ate an extra 100 calories a day, I'd put an extra 10 pounds a year, 200 calories a day, an extra 20 pounds a year. No, I'm not gonna gain 20 pounds from the extra 200 calories, because as you take in excess calories, the body revs up its metabolic rate to try to burn them off. So I only gained 10 pounds the year, year not 20 pounds. But you, when you speed up your metabolic rate, you're aging faster, and you're speeding up the, the, burn, the loss of stem cells, the loss of telomeres. Your body can raise metabolic rate by increasing its respiratory quotient, and by raising its body temperature, or by revving up the thyroid, all biological systems that make you age faster. So you're paying a pack with the devil. When you undershoot your calories a little bit, I'm gonna go 100 calories less than my metabolic needs. I'm not gonna lose all that weight because my body will slow down a bit. Mm -hmm. It'll lower the body temperature. I'll be colder in the winter time. I'll need to wear the warmers in my hands when I'm going skiing and an extra maybe layer on this when, but, but, and my thyroid function may be a little lower and my mm -hmm. respiratory quotient will be lower. 
But that's the secret to the to aid, to slowing the aging process. And you also said, if you don't mind me objecting to that also term, you said you believe. Sorry, I sorry. also don't believe anything. Okay, you I'm very skeptical yeah. of everything. <laughs> I, I'm trying to do the best I can at, at in an in-depth review of all the science, looking at thousands of articles and seeing where the most evidence, where the preponderance of evidence lies, so people can make judgments based on. Um, the full degree of science, like a lot of people in the nutrition field, we use some short-term double-binded controlled studies to come up with a hypothesis and advise people on what to eat. And I'm saying, no, that's a hypothesis. We've got to, to really feel good, definitive, that we're giving people good advice. We have to take, make sure the long-term epidemiologic studies that, are, that have thousands of people looking at them, their health for decades that look at hard endpoints like death or heart attack or cancer, and see if they corroborate the short-term studies. They both are in agreement. If they're all not in agreement, we can't come to any conclusion. So I'm trying to come to, the, come to giving people advice based on where there's the most evidence and the, and the studies are in agreement with each other to make the evidence of a higher degree of credence. Mm -hmm. Well, now it's cleared up why I can stay lean because I eat at least three to five hundred more calories than I probably need every day, single day. <laughs> so, but um, that's interesting, though. I just want to comment on the fact that most of us want to, we, when we read books or there's articles about losing weight and being healthy, they're all talking about how to rev up your metabolism. But what Dr. Furman's saying is, is that it's healthier to actually have a slower metabolism because you you age less slowly. I imagine that also yeah. goes with cancer will grow less slowly. That's right. There's no such thing as losing weight to rev up. It's a biggest scam. It's comic book information that people are trying to, mm -hmm. it's just to sell people, you know, rev up your metabolism. You can eat, eat more food and not get fat. That's just nonsense. You know, there's no, you can't, you're not going to get away with eating more food and not getting fat. You're still going to gain weight, but the food, extra calories are what rev up your metabolism. But you're, but you're paying a price for the devil. If anything, if there was a magical pill that could rev up your metabolism, so you without ca putting calories in, then well, it there's has plenty to of those. <laughs> right, then it would be toxic because <laughs> only noxious or toxic substances. Then it's called a pharmacologic effect, mm -hmm. and pharmacologic effect comes from the toxicity of the substance. If it can't be, it can't do both. It can't be. If I give you a pill to, you know, to make you knock you out, maybe put you to sleep, or to wake you up, or to make you urinate more, or urinate less. It's got to be toxic, because if it has pharmacologic effects, it's poisonous. Healthy things don't have those powerful pharmacologic effects. So what I'm saying is that, exactly, to make this clear, is we want to eat healthfully, so we get our nutrients and don't have to overeat to get them, and we want our metabolic rate to be a little slowed, so we don't get too thin. We want to eat as little as possible, not get too thin. We want to have good musculature as we age and good strength. And body. so we don't want it. But that's so we want to. But we get healthy. We don't have to overeat. We're getting good nutrients in. We're not have to. And when you're unhealthy, you eat, you, you're, you become a calorie consuming monster. You're fatigued all the time. You have to keep calories coming in all the time to keep your energy up. And you're forced to overeat by the, because the quality of your diet is too low. When you're eating a healthy diet, you feel great all the time, and you can be in touch with true hunger, and you get the instinctual signals of when to eat and when not to eat. And it becomes easy to eat the right amount of food. And you're more comfortable eating the right amount of food. And this becomes more instinctual eating. Mm -hmm. I'd love to go back to uh, nutrient density. Um, I, I just have always had a pretty big appetite. And when I came out of my anorexia and, and kind of catapulted into bulimia, which was then, you know, obviously a lot of overeating, uh, the calories that I was taking in were probably mostly nutrient void. And so although my stomach was filling up, I never felt satiated. And I've, and I've learned now on a very nutrient dense uh, eating habit, I still don't love to call anything diets, but uh, when I eat more nutrient dense, um, my brain is not telling my stomach anymore that I need more. And when you eat void of nutrients, maybe your stomach starts to fill up, but your brain still tells you that it's hungry because it needs the, needs the nutrients. And you conducted a study on hunger and the perception of hunger between eating a high nutrient diet and then one that is less nutrient dense. What did you find um, in that study? Yeah, isn't that fascinating? And what I'm what I'm proud of is that study is used by researchers on hunger and diet all over the world. From all the people that's being that referenced that study in 2012. Um, yes, it found that as people improved the nutrient quality of their diet, they desired less calories, of course. Mm -hmm. And instead of hunger being fatigue and stomach cramping and headaches, it turned to become more of a now a throat and neck 
and upper chest sensation in here. So their perception of hunger changes. And hunger was no longer as uncomfortable. It gave you a signal to eat, but you could go, if somebody calls me up on the phone and say, I'm, I'm coming home from work and I'm hungry, and want to eat dinner. And they call me up and say, Joel, you want to play some tennis? I'll say, sure, I'll eat the tennis court. I'll skip, I'll eat dinner later. It's not so uncomfortable, you can't just go, I'll go for it. Sure, I'll go with you, we'll, place it. we'll do something. And I'll, you know, the point is, and it goes away when you go start running or start moving around anyway. But so it's not, so hunger isn't something that uncomfortable or painful. It just gives you a signal it's time to eat. Hunger is not an emergency. Uh, which yeah, is a, an emergency, we, right. we treat uh, a lot of times that. Um, uh, can you talk about your pyramid, just so people get a real idea? You talked about G-bombs, but um, can you put the, w tell us what it looks like so we can see what are the most nutrient-dense fo foods and which one should we get the most of in our diet and on up? Well, you know, thank you for that. And, and, and I, I, you mentioned earlier, which I'm 100% in agreement with, is that we have an unprecedented opportunity in human history today to eat a huge variety of different types of plants. We can eat microgreens. We can eat, you know, we can eat fruit and the berries in the wintertime. We can get frozen wild blueberries. Yeah. We can get, we have beans of all types. We have soy, we, you know, and variety is, is huge. So the blue zones had, didn't have a huge variety in their diet. We can do better than a blue zone could have done. You know, we can use modern science to pick the best habits of almost all the different blue zones, which all had one good thing they were doing, but there was nobody that put together all these best things from every blue zone into a dietary portfolio, which is what a nutritarian diet does. It tries to put together all the lifespan anti-cancer factors into one dietary portfolio. You know, so, so absolutely that the, um, that when we, that the base of the pyramid is vegetables, but we don't want to just eat one type of green vegetable. We want to have, we don't just have kale and strawberries, and we want to have a different green vegetables. We want to have both raw and cooked, both cruciferous and non-cruciferous. We want to eat artichokes and asparagus and, and green broccoli and, and lettuces and dip. So, but the fact that we can eat all this variety is huge, and we can eat colorful vegetables and orange things and, and kombucha squashes and different different peas and snow pea pods. And, you know, I'm in just, I'm in so much, I'm enthralled with, with growing so much of my own food here now that I'm, you know, in Cal that I moved to California. I, I always, but when I was living in New Jersey, I had a garden. I grew a lot of my own food. I grew, I had a, I made a greenhouse too, and I grew, tried to grow as much as I could. I, I, it's like a hobby to garden and may, I get a thrill from eating something you grew yourself or picking it from something you made yourself with a good soil. And so, but that's what, you know, regenerative organic agriculture is all about. And we do have a lot of farmers who are very conscientious. And just hopefully the world moves in this direction where people start understanding that good food and good soil and putting, planting and taking care of the earth and all this takes care of our body to allow the earth to continue to grow and to prosper. It's very different from the way the fast food, you know, killing the world mentality and driving the planet into extinction by killing all animals and, and um, polluting and heating our climate change and destroying the oceans and destroying the, earth, the soils and just so the future generations can't benefit from our planet. Mm -hmm. It's just, um, we live in a real... Um, insane time because taking care of your own body has the same mentality and same long-term projections and the idea of long-term intelligence means you do the right thing now that's going to benefit you down the road in the future. Mm -hmm. What do you fertilize um, your soil with? Wow, that's a great question. I use, I have my own compost bin which I put um, red wigglers, worms, and different types of worms in there. And of course, I, I don't just, I put um, coconut husks in with a little peat moss, but I put a lot of plant material, you know, either what grass clippings or leaves. But if, but mostly I don't want to use grass clippings from commercially lawned areas. I'm usually using the pine needles from the true from the um, from the wild forests, you know, mm. to put in there. But the soil I purchased though has biochar in it and earthworm casting and bat guano I got in there. Instead, I don't use chicken manure or animal manure, but I have some because they're they give the chemicals to the, to the animals that are in this. But I do have yeah. some bat guano in there, and I have um, jungle and forest compost in there, too, um, and some prime soils, some um, virgin soils. So I really have some great soil I've made um, to, to plant my trees and to plant my vegetables in, which makes, which makes it amazing because well, sometimes the rabbits will eat something, right? and, and within like two weeks it comes right back up, and it's like it, it, it grows incredibly fast, <laughs> an incredible large amount of food, and you don't even need that much space to grow a huge amount of food. Yeah, you yeah. don't. I have the elevated beds now. I put the wooden beds on top of cement blocks 
So I have the eight foot beds mm. or six foot beds sitting on top of cement blocks so the rabbits won't get up there and eat all the vegetables. And also it keeps the soil, the high quality soil separate from the whatever was grown in this part of the country from whatever kind of any kind of um, you know, toxicity that could be in the natural soil. Yeah. 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 I have a tower. So they can't. Oh, you have a tower. Yeah, we the, the, we the have the condos. Or, yeah. You mean the worm condos? No, no, like oh. a vegetable tower. Oh, like, oh, you know, oh, so oh that, I thought the, the, the compost you had. The a rabbits or the uh, raccoons or whatever, they just, it's a, it's a big base where the water stays. And so they just, it's, you know, it's just um, Protect, plastic. You know. So it's slippery. They can't even climb up. So you're kind of like, don't even have to worry about that issue because it's, you know, as animal yeah. activists, that's a tough conversation. Like, <laughs> you know. In Jersey, I had to bring fences and I had to dig the fence right down to the cement below yep. the ground in the back yep. to make sure, you know, deer and other animals don't come in and eat your vegetables. And ship and um, woodchucks too could come in and destroy oh, everything. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Most definitely. Uh, uh, I just want to just finish up on, on your pyramid. So the vegetables are on the bottom. And then tell, tell us how you go up. Um, and, and, the, and because you add nuts and seeds. Some, some folks feel nuts and seeds uh, are not as crucial. Um, so can you tell us more about go these up foods the that you feel are so nutrient dense that are important for us to eat? Yes, yeah, um, um, the G-bombs, and be, including beans and fresh fruit and different types of vegetables. I don't think grains are that essential, but certain grains certainly are quinoa are healthy. Mm -hmm. I do think that um, dried soybeans that can, and edamame are super healthy anti-cancer foods and should be included in the diet. And they're not as, you know, tofu and soy milk are more processed. I want people to make an effort to include some real soybean in there, like a dried bean in there. Mm -hmm. And yet, that the, we give more credence to long-term epidemiologic studies, and here's what they all show with an overwhelming amount of concordance. In other words, what I'm saying right now is that every study looked at this issue about nuts and seeds in the diet or out of the diet as a source of fat in vegan populations and non-vegan populations. And every study with thousands of participants showed the same thing, about a 39% reduction of cardiovascular death and about a 20% reduction in all-cause mortality, including reduction in cancer deaths. From, ex from including nuts and seeds in your diet, at least one ounce a day. Excluding nuts and seeds from your diet is a major risk factor for cardiac arrhythmia, sudden cardiac death, and increases the risk of cancer, and you're not absorbing the phytochemicals from the foods you're eating. So the, and in the Seventh-day Adventist Health Study too, which is one of the most um, important studies because it looked at people eating different amounts of animal products and showed more animal protein, I mean more death and more plant protein made for longer life. That means paying some attention to protein on a plant-based diet where you're eating edamame and you're eating quinoa and asparagus and artichokes and beans that are high in protein and nuts that are high in protein, not just having you know, a macrobiotic diet based on rice or a fruitarian diet or a potato-based diet. It showed that paying attention to the variety of these amino acid mix is actually enhanced lifespan. But one thing that all these studies showed conclusively, and I'm talking about literally scores of studies showing the same thing, that the exclusion of nuts and seeds from a diet increases the risk of your risk of death and shortens lifespan. It's not a question or even a contra it's not a controversy. It's just you have radical components within the vegan community. But among us uh, nutritional scientists and physicians, I don't think there's any controversy. Right. What the evidence shows are overwhelming. Right. Thank you. Well, you've written over a dozen books, uh, including those seven New York Times bestsellers. So, folks, if you want to learn more about the science that Dr. Joel Furman has put together and such great um, recommendations for how to live a disease-free, uh, long, long, happy <laughs> life, uh, then I really um, recommend that it, it you go find his books. They can be find, found um, very easily because um, they're so popular and he has such a, a strong fan base. So thank you so much, Dr. Furman, for being on the show. We really appreciate all the information that you've shared with us. My pleasure. I had a lot of fun and look forward to doing it again. Best of health, of course, to you guys and all your listeners. So thank you so much for tuning in today. If we helped you in any way, then click the subscribe button and let's keep hanging out together. We have so much more to share with you. And if you need more information on actually making the switch for good, please visit us at switchforgood.org for loads of info. And you can subscribe to our mailing list where you will receive all sorts of super cool gifts, discount codes to our very fave dairy-free products, and a lifetime of powerful health tips. So join us on the journey to switch for good. This is the future.